Hey everybody, welcome back to another edition of Ed's Attention to Detail. So today, I want to talk about an F8 Crusader, and I actually have a pair of F8 Crusaders sitting here in front of me. And there's a little bit of a story behind this. By the time you guys see this, uh, I will have already presented this F8 Crusader to George, or the Shade Tree Fix-It Man. And I'll leave a link right up here so that you guys can find his channel. Now George, he was in the Navy and he was a plane captain in VF-191, Satan's Kittens. Uh, this was back in, I wanna say 1975, 76 time frame. But anyway, George asked me to build this model for him. This is a model of the plane that he was a plane captain on. This is the correct Buno number, correct side number. And he had sent me a couple of photos And yes, that is George when he was back in 1975, a little bit younger than he is now. But anyway, um, yeah, he had asked me to build this model. And so long story short, he sent me the model and now uh, you guys can go back through some of my older videos and kind of follow the storyline. But this is a Hasegawa F8E 148 scale um, model. And this one over here, this is one that I had built previously. This is actually a Ravel F8E uh, Crusader, and I built it a long time ago and selected the decals for VF-11, which was one of the squadrons that used to be in one of the air wings that I was attached to. So anyhow, I decided to dig this one out to kind of show you uh, the comparison of the two models, uh, Hasegawa versus the Ravel monogram. And I'm going to give you a little bit of history about the FAD also. So let's get into it. Okay, so I know you guys can't see me very well, but I'm going to kind of talk you through this just a little bit. So originally, the airplane was known as the F8U Crusader. It was built by Vought and it first flew, the first prototype flew in February of 1955. It had a variable incident wing and it tilted up at seven degrees. Its primary offensive weapons was four 20 millimeter auto cannons. And you can see the, the cannon ports here on the side of the forward fuselage on these. And it had four, it had two on either side. Uh, it was known as the last of the gunfighters, and the reason for that was this is the last aircraft that was purposely built with machine guns installed as a primary weapon. Now later on we got into Gatling guns, this is a, a, a gun that actually rotates, it has six barrels on it, and uh, this is something that they learned after Vietnam that the guns actually really did work. Um, but uh, so. F-8s were known as the last of the gunfighters. There were 1,261 F-8s that were built. This includes the, uh, the early F-8As all the way through the last production, um, and they also built a reconnaissance version of the F-8, and this is included in the 1,261 that were built. Now, out of the 1,261 that were built, this is an interesting number. 1,106 were involved in what they consider a major mishap. So this was not a very easy aircraft to fly and it was an even harder aircraft to land on board the carrier. So out of the 1,261 that were built, 1,106 of them were involved in mishaps. A pretty high number of, of aircraft that were involved in mishaps. So, I'm going to talk about these two in particular right now. Uh, these are F-8Es, or at least an F-8E here, and this one started as an F-8E, and I, I built it as an F-8J, and I'll talk about that here in just one moment. So for the F-8E, there were 286 of them built. Of that 286, 
136 of them were made into, remanufactured, upgraded to the F8J standard. Uh, F8J uh, had the boundary layer control. Air from the compressor of the engine was routed across the flaps to help increase, increase lift when the flaps were lowered. It had wet pylon capability, which means they could actually hang drop tanks on the wings of this aircraft and transfer the fuel back into the wing. Now they had pylons on the F8E also, but they were not wet. They could not transfer fuel back into the aircraft where the J could. Both of these, uh, the E and the J, had the J57P20A afterburning jet engines, and they were capable of 18,000 pounds of strat static thrust. And they also had the AN-APQ-124 radar. Uh, that's the, uh, the F8J. Now, another notable about the F8s was it was the first jet fighter in U.S. service to fly sustained flight at over a thousand miles an hour. So not only was it a supersonic aircraft, but it could sustain a thousand miles an hour in level flight. Um, and that was pretty impressive back in 1955 when the first prototype flew. I built this aircraft to represent the one that he was plane captain on. And this is aircraft 110 from VF-191, Satan's Kittens. And the aircraft Buno number, which is back here on the tail, is 150658. Now one thing I did find out is that this aircraft, uh, it served with VF-191 for an extended period of time. It used to be side number 112. And I have a photo of that. But the thing that I really found interesting was this aircraft was retired from Naval Service and it was sent to the, uh, the Boneyard, Amark. And I have a photo of it sitting in the Boneyard as well. Now, unlike a lot of these older aircraft that end up in the boneyard, this particular airplane had a second life, if you will. It was sold to the French Navy. Now, not as a F-8, uh, I want to call them, uh, I don't know, a K, I think was the designation for those, but I I'm not real sure. But the, the French Navy actually took some and remanufactured them and uh, made them into their own naval uh, fighters. But this aircraft was sold to the French Navy for parts to keep the other Crusaders in the air all the way up to 1989. So, like I said, this aircraft not only had a full service with the United States Navy, but it actually was sold to the, uh, to the French and it helped to keep their Crusaders in the air for quite some time. Over 30 years, the Crusader was in the air as a frontline fighter. So, anyway, that's my... Uh, my F8J model build, and I know that it took quite some time for me to build this model. Um, and I'll show you a couple of still photos of it as well. So I'm just trying to spin it around here so you guys get you know, a good look at it. But I believe that this one turned out pretty well, and I hope that George likes this. Um, like I said before, by the time you see this video, he would have already received the model and uh, I'm pretty sure that he's gonna enjoy it. So, real quick look underneath the bottom. Not a whole lot of detail underneath there to really be seen, but uh, you can see the tail hook in the back and the landing gear, landing gear wheel wells. And so. So, anyway, uh, one of the things I wanted to show you here real quick and kind of bring these up so you can see them is uh, this is a Hasegawa F8E model. This is a Ravel F8E model. And if you look really closely at the canopies, you'll notice that this canopy is a little bit more narrow than this one. This one is a little bit wider. Let's see, get that camera angle so maybe you can see the difference between them. Um, like I said, this one was a little wider, this one was a little bit more narrow. This is more accurate of the aircraft than this one is. Um, 
It's not something that I was really overly concerned with and I never really noticed that the Revell model had such a wide canopy on it until I built the Hasegawa model. So just one of the differences between the two. Now you'll also notice that the Revell model had armament. The Hasegawa model did not come with armament. Uh, the Hasegawa comes with this infrared tracking uh, sensor on the nose where the Revell model did not. And down the intake of, which is just below the nose of the aircraft, the Hasegawa seems to have a more defined intake trunk than the Revell model did. But not a huge difference between the two. Um, one of the other things that is kind of notable is the little scoops right here on the back. Uh, this was for the afterburner. Uh, the scoops on the Hasegawa model are a little bit more slender than the ones on the Revell model. And again, the Hasegawa model is a little bit more accurate of the actual aircraft than the Revell model. So, but there is a pretty big price difference between these two model kits. And uh, I want to say that the Revell model came in somewhere around the $28 range where the Hasegawa model is at least double that. So there you have it guys. I hope you enjoyed taking a look at these two models. Um, I know that you've seen this one before in a video, but uh, you haven't seen this one. So um, thanks for watching, really appreciate it. And uh, I don't know what else can I say. God bless, take care, and remember, pay attention to the details. We'll see you again soon, bye. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already and go ahead and hit the notification button so you know when I'm doing a new video. Like this video, and leave me a comment down below. Let me know what you think. Also, feel free to share this with any of your social media sites.